Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for being here. We're excited to have you with us for our webinar today. If you can predict it, you can plan for it. We're going to go ahead and get started. So my name is Erin Green, and I'm the Director of National Training in the Boystown Press. And just a little information about me. I've been working with children for more than 20 years. So roughly half of that time has been here at Boys Town. And that has ranged with kids of all ages, from infant all the way to late teens and early adulthood, and kids in a general ed as well as a special ed environment. Just so you know, the Boys Town National Training Department travels nationally and internationally to schools, training and consulting on the Boys Town education model. And what that means is that we work with educators on behavior management at the school-wide and classroom level. We work on social emotional learning and we work on meeting the needs of students where, they're, where they are in their development through a multi-tiered system of support. You may also be aware that Boys Town is a mission-driven organization. At Boys Town, our focus is on changing the way America cares for children, families, and communities by providing and promoting an integrated continual of care that instills Boys Town values to strengthen body, mind, and spirit. And the fact is we've been doing this for nearly 100 years. We have worked to strengthen communities as we support children and families seeking healing. And that healing might be related to past trauma or relational challenges or even mental health concerns. Boys Town provides a range of services to meet children and families where they're at and to serve them in the greatest capacity possible. We also work hard to empower schools to effectively deal with the ever-increasing challenges that present themselves every day our research-driven and supported education model provides schools and programs with a safe, positive, and proactive approach to teaching pro-social behaviors. We provide multi-tiered support for students with variable needs and increase the consistency and effectiveness of staff. So let's take a look about our goals for today. Today our focus is going to be on predicting and planning to meet the needs of students. And if you think about it, when we teach academics, we expect to spend time teaching rules, and we spend time on things like the rule of multiplying by zero in math. We establish procedures like the process for long division or steps for column addition, and we're ready and prepared to practice that. So we practice things like our multiplication tables and build those skills. We're prepared and teach, but we also predict that some students are going to struggle. So we set up lessons and we set up frequent opportunities to practice. The same needs to happen for behavior. Our learning environments will run a lot more smoothly if we establish our school and classroom rules, our procedures, and the skills we expect early, and we practice them as we need to. And that's what we're going to focus on today. We're going to focus on predicting and planning for the behavioral needs of your classroom. Let's look first at a couple of video examples. In the first set of these examples, you're going to see two different environments. And in the videos, while none of the behaviors that you're seeing are extreme, you definitely get the feeling that things could be handled a little bit better with some support. Be quiet. Enrique, Shaquana, Christina. All right, can I please have everyone's attention up here? Shh. Okay, so like I said, the videos that we just saw, two environments, nothing dramatic going on overall but definitely environments that we'd want to see the kids behaving a little bit differently in. In that first example, we'd want to set the expectation for what we expect to see our students doing when we're passing back work or when we want to keep um, the volume down in the room. And then, of course, in the second example, in the lunchroom, we don't necessarily want to see kids pulling each things off each other's plates, and we would want to work with them a little bit on that. Let's take a look at two more examples. And in these videos, you'll definitely see a clear difference. So I'm going to ask you to do in a moment is I'm going to ask you to all stand up in a moment. And when you stand up, would you all please move back one row? So row one is going to go to row two. Row two is going to go to three, three to four, and four to five. Okay, you'll still stay in the same letter. You'll just be moving the number. Okay, any questions? All right, do me a favor, everybody stand up, please. And can you move back one row? All right. Uh, 
Okay, boys and girls, it's time to go. Remember when you go, what, chairs up? Yep. Line up for your assignment books. Books open. Yep. Okay. All right. So in those last two examples, again, what you could see was the teacher had taught them at some point to go ahead and follow these instructions and particularly in that gym example, he clearly defined what he expected from them and what he wanted them to do. They stayed quiet as they all followed his instruction and moved backwards. And then in the second example, those end of day procedures were not something that they were surprised by. In fact, that little boy in the blue shirt in the front that gets kind of excited and keeps saying, yep, yep, you can tell this was routine for him and he was eager to, to follow that instruction. Getting your class to behave that way doesn't happen overnight, and it's something that takes some practice. So we're going to start by looking at rules. Rules help communicate how students should behave in school. They also help create a predictable and stable environment that is more conducive to healthy and positive interactions. It's not uncommon to see rules at the whole school level, and in fact, if you can get those rules at the whole school level, you'll see a consistency that's really valuable. But in order for rules to be as effective as, as, as possible, they should follow some guidelines. So we're gonna talk through some of those guidelines now. First, rules should be stated positively and behaviorally. So instead of telling a student what not to do, tell him or her what you want, him to, want them to do instead. For example, you might say be respectful instead of saying something like don't talk out of turn. Sometimes we find ourselves trying to make a list of rules that's so inclusive that we end up with seven, 10, 15 rules that make it nearly impossible for students to remember. So rules should be limited to three to five general behaviors so students can remember them. For example, for a younger student, you might have a rule on keeping hands, feet, and objects to yourself. For a middle school or high school student, you might say something more like be responsible or be safe. And from there, you can get more specific with your procedures on how you define those rules. And we're actually gonna talk a little bit more about procedures here shortly. Another guideline is to make sure that you establish the rule. Once you establish a rule, it's something you can actually enforce. I was at an elementary school in Memphis and the rule there in the lunchroom was no talking during lunch. So you can imagine if you've got a room full of active, antsy kids, it was very unlikely that that rule was gonna be consistently enforced. Not to mention that our goal is to state things positively and behaviorally. So when you say things like no talking during lunch, you're leaving it up to the kids to decide what to do instead. So that might look like singing or shouting or doing a lot of other behaviors instead. What really probably would have been more effective and would have been less frustrating for kids and for the educators was to have a rule along the lines of maintain a conversational tone in the lunchroom or speak at a level one in the lunchroom. And then of course, you would spend your time defining what level one means so that that's clear to them. Next, when you think about school rules, it's really important that classroom rules are consistent with the policies of the school and that they're consistently managed and enforced. For example, if the school rule is that cell phones are supposed to be put away during school hours, then your classroom rule might be something like, technology must stay in your backpack or locker. And then you just have to make sure that it's consistent. So if a student is in Ms. Taylor's room and if she's okay with having cell phones out on your desk as long as you're not using them, and but they go to Mr. Dwyer's room and he follows the school policy and the school rule, and if the phone's out, then he takes that school or confiscates that phone, you have a lot of different issues that can come as a result of that. So we suggest that you make sure you're consistent with those rules and that you're following them and they're consistent with policy. And then lastly, of course, if you consider the environment and the number of environments that your students are in each day, imagine if each of those different rooms or those different environments has three to five rules, let alone more like seven to 10, which we see a lot of times. Your students might need to know upwards of 20, 30, 40, even more different rules. So make sure that you're posting those rules and you're reviewing them with, frequently with students as you need to. So now we'd like to hear from you. Time for a poll question. When you think about the school-wide or classroom rules you currently have in place, what we'd like you to do is check off which guidelines your current rules meet. And we'll take just a minute or so to complete the poll. You can, you can select more than one option.
All right, so you can see here in the results that consistent with school policies was clearly ahead. And that is not uncommon, but it's so important. So we're really glad to see that there. Also stated behaviorally and positively. And like I mentioned before, that's the same thing that applies to when you're talking about procedures and skills. If you can tell kids what you want to see from them instead of what you don't want to see from them, it's easier for them to follow that and less likely that they're going to make up their own options for what you want to see instead. Sounds like being posted and frequently reviewed, about half of us are doing that consistently. That's really important, especially when you think about the number of rules that our kids are uh, dealing with every single day. And so if you have school-wide rules, that's fantastic. You should have them posted and review them as you need to. And then, of course, if you have individual rules for your classroom, which you might need to have, especially if you have special equipment that you're working with or safety concerns or just want to generally kind of work with your kids a little differently, just make sure you're posting those and that they can set those up for what environment that they're in. All right, when I talked about guideline number two, about general behaviors, I mentioned that general rules will usually need some additional explanations or definitions. And one way we handle this is by establishing procedures. Let's start by defining procedures. Procedures are consistent, clear processes for accomplishing specific tasks. So think for a minute about the tasks that you need to accomplish throughout the day. Things like turning in your homework, or entering or leaving a classroom or lunch count. Having consistent, clear steps to get these tasks accomplished throughout the day is definitely going to make your day run a little more smoothly, and it's going to increase the likelihood of success for your students. So we want to hear from you again, remembering that procedures should support the established rules that you have in place. Just type in your chat box and make sure you address it to all participants. What are some of the situations or time of your school day for which you need procedures? And again, just specific situations, times of your school day that you need procedures. Class changes, good example. Transition times are big. Good. Morning transitions and dismissals, recess, good. Lunch, unstructured times of the day, such a good way to put that. School assemblies, excellent. Transitions again, study hall for seventh graders. Oh yeah, that's a tough one. Lighting up to leave a room, nice one. Sharpening pencils, handing in homework, great examples of things we need done in our class. Daily five, guest teachers or subs, good. Fire drills and cafeteria, and we're gonna talk about some of these procedures in a couple of minutes. Arrival and dismissal, definitely the less structured or overlap time, very nice. Field trips. Bathroom and transitions and sharpening pencils. Good, you guys have come up with some really excellent examples. Just remember, you can establish procedures for anything that you need to accomplish during your day. So let's talk about some guidelines for how to do that. How do you make sure that your procedures are as simple as possible for kids to follow and for you to enforce as well and to help your class or building run a little more smoothly? So again, talked about lots of examples in the chat. Don't wanna rehash all of those. But what you just accomplished was the very first step of developing procedures, and that is deciding what you want to accomplish. Secondly, think about the behaviors that you need to accomplish in order, in order to accomplish a task. So one way to do this is really just to brainstorm the behaviors you want to see. And envision your mind that the task is being completed. Don't necessarily worry about the order first, instead worry about what the behaviors look like. What do you need your kids to be able to do in order to complete that task? And that's fine because in the very next step, you're going to work on more about the order. You're going to be looking at what to do versus, you know, staying those behaviorally again, what to do versus what not to do, and then putting those in order, making sure those steps are in order that they need to be followed in order to accomplish that task. Remember, just like we talked about when we're establishing rules, your students are required to follow a large number of procedures each day as well. So when you post, make sure you post them. Also make sure that you're teaching and reviewing them as you need to, and that is really important. With these guidelines in mind, let's look at four key procedures your students may actually benefit from. And I know many of you mentioned that you needed um, you needed procedures for the bathroom and transition times and lunch count and lunch rooms. And so those are some of the things we're going to talk about just now. We talked about ideas like turning in homework, lunch count, entering and leaving a classroom, 
Um, there were a couple people who mentioned sharpening pencils, and that's excellent. In our experience, when we are out and about doing observations in schools, those common areas, those unstructured areas, those are sometimes the biggest struggle for students. So things like the transitioning of classes or in the hallway, using the bathroom, getting food and eating in the cafeteria, being safe at recess, those all can be real challenges. And if you don't have clear procedures in place, kids are definitely going to make up their own minds on how they're going to accomplish that. So let's look at some examples of those procedures that you can use to help keep order in those common areas. A few years ago, we were at a large urban high school in Chicago. And there were lots of challenges going on when we first went to that school. One of the most prevalent issues we saw was related to that transition or those passing periods, that unstructured time in the hall. Students were tended to be clumped around lockers. There was rough housing and fighting, public displays of affection, other inappropriate and sometimes even unsafe activities were things that we were seeing. The fact was, even if teachers wanted to be out in the hallway, which was so unpleasant that many of them didn't, it was nearly impossible for them to monitor the hallway because of all the chaos. Students were consistently tardy to the next period, and even those who weren't engaging in inappropriate activities tended to fall victim to the chaos of just trying to get through the hall on time. So one of our first recommendations, and one that definitely made a large impact, was putting hallway procedures in place. So let's look at an example of a hallway procedure. I'll give you a few seconds to go ahead and read through that. Okay. So I know it's frustrating, and it's frustrating when students aren't doing what they need to be doing in the hallway. But it's hard to get upset with students for being chaotic in the hallway if we haven't made our expectations clear to them. Or in some cases, if we haven't defined what that should look like. So the, for our school in Chicago that I was referencing, teaching those procedures to students and holding them accountable through the hallway sweeps and with specific, appropriate, and consistent consequences did make a big impact on that school. You'll also see in this example that we follow the same general guideline of keeping the number of steps to three to five, and it makes it more likely that students and teachers will be able to follow and remember that procedure. By the way, I referenced a minute ago consequences and consistencies. If, you, if this is something that as um, a school or at, in your class that you're struggling with, we do have a free webinar on this topic. So just a side note, go ahead and check that out, our free webinar on tolerances and consequences, which is on voicetowntraining.org. And we've got, it, it's just under the resources tab. So if that's something that you're interested in, no cost to you, but you definitely can find that. Let's look at another example of a procedure for a common area that students struggle with, and that is the bathroom. Who among us hasn't walked into a bathroom and found clutter or trash or just other general shenanigans going on? It's one of those rooms where there's not a lot of supervision going on in the bathroom. And when there isn't supervision, there are lots of kids gathered and they don't have specific procedures. These tend to, they tend to turn it into a little bit of a playground, right? So naturally, in your class, you're going to want to have a procedure for requesting to use the restroom. But consider follow the following steps for what to do once permission is granted, or if you're using the restroom during a passing period. Again, this procedure really is easy to follow and remember, and it can help keep your students out of trouble. But keep in mind, you can customize this to meet your needs. So just because this is a procedure that we recommend, it doesn't mean this procedure that you have to use. For example, maybe your school uses paper towels, and you might want to make sure that the kids know what to do with the paper towels before they leave the room. And you might say something like, wash and dry your hands and throw a paper towel in the garbage, or whatever your guidelines are. And then follow that with promptly and quietly return to class. You'll notice that we did put qualifiers in our procedures, like promptly and quietly. And that's there for a reason, and essentially, Kids can follow a procedure and return to class. If you didn't have promptly and quietly in there, that return might come later than you expected. It might be accompanied by some loud hallway behavior. So any, any guidance that you can give to kids to tell them what you expect from them and just remind them of that is really important. And a procedure is a great way to include that. Another thought related to bathroom procedure is that if you have your students have to carry assigned agenda or a hall pass of some sort, 
tell them what you want them to do with the agenda or hall pass while they're in the restroom. Because if you don't tell them what you want them to do, they'll come up with their own options and you really may not like the results, right? So now we're going to look at a procedure for a situation that's often considered the pain of a teacher's existence, and that is the infamous lunchroom duty. Lunchrooms are never going to go away. They're a necessary part of the day, and students need to be supervised in the lunchroom. We've all walked into a noisy lunchroom that's chaotic, and we thought, what on earth is happening in here? Or uh, did that student really just do that? And that thought may then quickly be accompanied by the thought of, oh, great, now I get to deal with it. We often hear from teachers that one of the biggest issues with their time in, on lunchroom duty is that they don't have relationships with all the students. So it's difficult for them to manage that environment. And anyone who is familiar with what we teach with Boys Town and our Boys Town education model knows that relationships are really important and we emphasize that through all of our teaching. But I can tell you confidently that in our experience, consistent lunchroom procedures and consequences do make a, a very big difference. So even if you don't have that relationship with each of the students, just knowing that you have a, a consistent procedure and you've got consistent consequences to fall back on is going to help you make a difference in that lunchroom. Imagine much, how much more pleasant the experience could be if your students could follow these steps. I'll give you a second to read those. Sometimes you might need additional steps or instructions. For younger students, they might need to know, you know, what do I, what do, I do if I need help opening my milk? Or you might need to clearly define what conversational tone means. And you should have an exit procedure that cl includes cleaning up and clearing your space that aligns nicely with your be responsible or be respectful school rules. Let's go ahead and look briefly at one more procedure. What do we do with our young kids after they've eaten and they've gotten all that energy stored up and they're ready for their favorite time of the day and that is recess. With all that excitement and energy, recess can get a bit out of control. But we want our kids to have playtime. We want them to be able to be free. We want them to have a good time but there does need to be some structure around that. What starts out as a fun game of kickball or four square can quickly turn into a fight about who was out and who wasn't and who was cheating. And then of course there's the race to the swings and how it's not fair that Kelly always gets to be on the swings first. Teaching students a procedure to safely play at recess will help them stay focused and kind of manage that energy in a positive way. So we've got some steps for you to consider in your recess procedure here. I'll give you a few seconds to read those. And each of these procedures, and this one in particular, would be supplemented really well by teaching them some social skills. So we're going to talk about that shortly, but you know, if you taught your kids uh, the skill of sharing, you might run into fewer of those, few of those arguments or disagreeing appropriately, you might run into disagreeing appropriately, excuse me, you might run into fewer of those arguments, just something to keep in mind. Also, for your best outcomes, make sure that you have an idea in mind on how to handle timeouts on the playground because they are bound to happen. If we could get our students to follow these procedures, it, it's not going to keep our playground incident free, but it's certainly going to help keep it more safe and orderly. Now, you may have noticed, but all four of these procedures are in that handout that came with the, that accompanied this webinar. So they're on page three of that handout. So feel free to use those, feel free to customize them, make them your own, but they're just some ideas on some common procedures that we've seen be successful in other schools. So now we'd like to hear from you again. If you'll go to your chat box and make sure you address this to all participants, which procedures do you think you and your team might want to incorporate into your school day? It doesn't have to limit yourself to the four that we've talked about here. There might be some others you want to talk about as well. Cafeteria, good. Hallway procedures, good. Bathroom, dismissal, nice. And that's, a, that's definitely one that we want to work on. Lunch. Just recognizing that whatever we can do to make our procedures consistent and teach them and remind students of them, we are going to see more success with that. So one way we accomplish that the hallway behavior is, is through that tolerances and consequences piece. So I would definitely recommend you take a look at that webinar. And like I said, we're going to show you how to get to that again at the end. If you can um, set your tolerances low and you have consistent consequences regardless of 
who the student is that's behaving that way and that they're held accountable in the hallways for the expectation of staying quiet, you are going to see more success there. We oftentimes see schools use things like um, the bubbles and bunny tails in the hallway also. So that's for younger students, but you can definitely consider something like that. I'm seeing a couple other notes here on guest teachers, break time good, cell phone procedures, switching with the partner teacher. I like that. Having the need to move or get some energy out and finishing work. And having the need to move or get energy out, that can be tough, especially as your students get older and recess is not a part of their structured day. So keep that in mind. The two that I'm seeing here are finishing work and accepting redirection. Those are actually really solid social skills. Um, and so you definitely want to work with your kids on those. And we, when we get to social skills, I'm going to talk a little more about that. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. Okay, so I just talked about, you know, we've, we've talked about our rules and procedures, and they really are important and help clarify expectations in the building. But like a couple of the examples we've been given here, they aren't necessarily enough to empower our students to be the self-managers and problem solvers that we want them to be. And so that's where our social skills come in. So let's talk about the difference between a skill and a procedure. They both are important in supporting rules and expectations. But procedures are more narrowly focused, and they outline the expectation for a specific task in a specific place. For example, the procedure for turning in homework or for sharpening a pencil may look different in your classroom than it does in Ms. Ms. Lutz's classroom, for example. Skills, on the other hand, are taught to students and they're generalizable to multiple settings. Our goal with skills is to get them to code switch and to generalize. They're designed to enable students to become those problem solvers and self-managers that we want them to be on more of a global basis. And just some information about social skills. At Boystown, we've task analyzed 183 social skills, and they range from basic to complex. As a side note, this, is, this book is an excellent reference. If you don't have access to it in your library, just something to be aware of. Our latest edition has really made some, some great improvements. We've pulled out four of the older social skills that are a bit outdated, and we've added five new skills that are really more relevant to the world that today's students kind of struggle with. We've also mapped the skills to social and emotional competencies and to executive functions. So some food for thought if you're looking for some help with specific skills, and we, we have skills in here on completing tasks, and we have skills in here on um, accepting criticism, and actually we're going to talk about accepting criticism or redirection here in just a minute. So let's take a look at five of the skills that when we teach them, we practice them with students, and we get them to move along and shape that behavior to mastery, there really are some of the most critical pieces to student success. So think for a minute about the number of instructions that our students receive every day. Even before they get to school, they're receiving instructions on time to get up, eat breakfast, put your dishes in the sink, brush your teeth, just to name a few. And then they get to school, and in each class, they're told what to get out, what page to turn to, to get quiet, or to move over here, or to work in this group. There's just a lot of instructions that they're receiving each day. And it's, you, know, you can be looking at dozens and dozens to well over 100 for many students. If you consider all of the rules and procedures that we've been discussing today, they really are not going to do any good if the students are not able or willing to follow instructions. And that's one of the first skills we recommend that educators teach to their students, and that is following instructions. So here are the steps to the skill of following instructions. If you think for a minute about your, your students who have not mastered that skill, and most of us probably are picturing one or two students right now that, and we probably don't have to think too hard about who those students are. How much more could we get accomplished during the day if all of our students could follow the instructions consistently? We could get into a conversation here on a parent's responsibility versus our own, but really it's not going to change the outcome. The fact is the student either doesn't know how to follow an instruction or is not motivated to do so. And either way, the only way to change the behavior is to start by teaching that to them and then reinforcing them for it. Another challenging situation for many students is how to appropriately handle being told no. 
As we all know, saying no is part of every teacher's job. And whether it's simply telling the student it's not his turn to leave the line or telling the student she can't return to her locker right now, it's part of our jobs. And accepting no is part of every student's job, but it is not easy and many of them struggle with it. So imagine the difference between a student who's mastered the skill of accepting no for an answer using these steps, and then compare that with a student who struggles with this skill and blows up every time he or she hears the word no. One of the most important steps in this process you'll see there is staying calm, and it's built directly into the skill because it's another reminder that now is not the time to blow up. That last step about asking later if you disagree, we sometimes get questions about that. It's there to let the student know that right now, while he or she is not happy about being told no, is not the time to disagree with, with the educator or with the parent or with whomever it is who's told them, given the no answer. Instead, they wait for a neutral time and ask the adult politely if they can talk about that no answer. And as a side note, there's another great skill that's related to this, it's disagreeing appropriately. And anytime you teach accepting no, teaching disagreeing appropriately is a great follow-up to that. We actually have a lesson plan on that that's available on our website at no cost to you. So just an FYI on that as well. We'll talk about how to get to some of those resources when we get to the end. I think you'll agree that your classroom could be so much more positive if you're able to teach and practice the skill with students. And that brings us to another hot button that many students have, and that is accepting criticism or consequence. No one, even adults, loves to be given negative, negative feedback, and most of us don't want to have to redo something that we spent our valuable time on. If you think about it, for a school day, a lot of times criticism or feedback that a student gets is related to their schoolwork, and that means that it might be something they have to redo. So you can imagine how excited they are about being given the news that they have to redo something. But no matter what way you look at it, feedback is part of our everyday lives. So being able to accept feedback or criticism the right way can make a big difference in the life of a student. It can help them succeed in school, it can help them keep a job, and it can help them maintain a relationship later in life. So teach them to accept feedback and here are some steps. One thing to note for this skill, and really for all of our skills, and I've mentioned this a few different times, is it's perfectly okay for you to customize these to meet your needs. For example, my children were born in the South, and we raised them, they say yes ma'am or yes sir. They would not say okay to me or yeah to me or something like that related to when I've been giving them, them criticism. However, their friends would, and that's perfectly okay with me because that's the environment they were raised in, that's, that's what they're that's expected of them. And so you have the same luxury. You can adjust these skills to match cultural needs or other needs that meet the needs of your students and your environment. Keep in mind that the skill of accepting feedback really should be taught and practiced frequently. A great time to prompt students about this skill is before you hand back the feedback on a tough paper or assignment. So let's think now about a skill that will help students complete that tough paper or assignment in the first place, and that is the skill of staying on task. I know it seems simple. We should all know that if we're given an assignment at home or at school or at work, and we've got a certain amount of time to get it done, we're most likely to be successful if we can stay on task. But how many of us, thinking about myself here too, we start on a task, for example, putting away some laundry, and end up on a totally different task, and maybe even not even completing the first task to begin with. So looking at the laundry example, if you're anything like me, you pick up the basket and you fully intend to run up to your bedroom and put the clothes away. But along the way, you notice an envelope on the table and it reminds you, oh, I need to make that payment I gotta get that done right now. So maybe you put your laundry basket at the bottom of the steps and you hop on the computer and schedule your automated bill pay. Oh, and while you're on the computer, you see that you have four new emails. So you quickly peruse the emails and remember that you still have an email to soccer coach that your son will be late to practice because of his dental appointment. So you send an email to the coach and you notice that you got another email alert that it's Amy's birthday. So you hop on Facebook to wish her a happy birthday really quickly. And then, of course, you get sucked into that Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter black hole. And it started out as a 15-second happy birthday. It turns into a 10, 20, or 30-minute social media scanning session. Eventually, you get back up. You walk into the other room. And by this time, you don't even remember what you were doing in the first place. And, oh, when you go to bed that night, you find your laundry basket sitting at the bottom of the stairs waiting for you to go up. I know this is a silly example. 
but the fact is that staying on task is a life skill that we all need to practice. So set your students up for success and make your own thing a little bit easier by teaching them these steps. So we see that last step there in the skill of staying on task, ignore distractions and interruptions from others. Well, we also want to teach them not only to ignore the distractions and interruptions from others, but how to work with others. So let's look at that social skill next. Think about your curriculum for a minute and consider your lesson plans and the formal and informal group work that you assign each school year. And now think about some of your students and how that group work typically goes. In my experience in schools, it's always interesting to me to observe students working in groups. I'm always interested to see, one, how the groups are assigned, and, and two, to what end the students are actually working with each other versus working near each other. The fact is that for many, working with others just isn't comfortable. It involves listening to others, and you may not feel like you have a lot in common with them. It's about trying to hear and value all others' opinions. It's about being away from your friends and sitting there wishing that you could be in the group with your friends and wondering what they're talking about over there. And it involves slowing yourself down and depending on others when ordinarily you might just prefer to depend on yourself. But being able to work with others is a life skill that we need. So consider teaching your students these steps. I think most of us would agree that group work is a part of nearly every job that we have. So it's a good idea to teach it now. And now's a great time for us to hear from you again. We'd like a poll question here. Curious about if you're using any of these social skills, and if so, you can mark which ones they are. Okay, and we're going to let you see these results here. We kind of see it spread around. Following instructions, definitely at the top. We see that a lot. Um, sometimes people refer to it as following directions. Either one is obviously acceptable, but that's a huge skill for students, as well as staying on task. So those are great, great skills to be working on. Working with others is one of those skills that takes some time, takes some practice. So suggest working on that with your students if it's not something you're doing already. And of course, the accepting no and accepting criticism. Those are the ones that sometimes tend to be triggers for additional behavior. So the earlier we can teach that for our students, the more likely we are to spend less time correcting for it later on. Okay, so what I'd like to do is take a, just a couple of minutes to look at the tools that were provided in your handout. So in addition to the procedures and skills that we've already gone over, there's a couple of templates in there that I want to walk you through or just kind of show you that will allow you to um, help you plan how to incorporate teaching the procedures and skills into your lessons. One way many of the schools that we work with have found success in introducing procedures or skills is through a, a planned skill of the week, lesson plan. And so here's an example of a template that you can use for that. Sometimes this is done at the whole school level, and anytime you can do that, it's fabulous because you know you do it as part of morning announcements or something like that, and everyone in the building is working on the same thing at the same time. But don't let that hold you back. If that's not something that you're able to do right now, think about what you have control over and what you can manage. And imagine what kind of more positive environment that you can make in your own class if you're able to incorporate skill teaching into your curriculum through something like a skill of the week. The template in your packet is something, feel free to copy that for as many skills as you'd like, okay? Don't limit yourself. And oh, another note here is that sometimes students, uh, schools will use, instead of skill of the week, they might do skill of the month or they might do a new skill every couple of weeks or something like that. So make it adapted to meet your needs and uh, make it your own. And let's take a look at an example of one that's completed. You have this in your packet, but we'll walk through this really quickly just so you get an idea of kind of what we're talking about and what an example of completed ones would look like. So using this example in this format, you really identify your time frame for when you want to introduce the skill. You list the skill and the, the steps of the skill. So that just kind of keeps everything focused on what that skill is. You'll also notice that the beginning of the week starts with the planned teaching lesson and the steps are drawn out right there for you on planned teaching, so I referenced that earlier, but that's, this example of following instructions has a planned teaching lesson built into it. It can be done you know, at the beginning of the day, during or after morning announcements, or before or during a related, a related academic lesson. So if you've got a lesson around following instructions, that's a great time to introduce a skill like this or to remind folks about this, uh, your students about a skill like this. And generally, these lessons really take a couple of minutes. 
You can set up your practice to be something that is just getting them involved with the activity or getting them involved with whatever the assignment is that you're going to be doing next. Make sure that you build in time throughout the week to practice and if you're looking for opportunities to reinforce that and praise them for exhibiting following instructions. In this example, the plan also includes a fun activity midweek. It's a bell ringer activity on following instructions. And this is a creative way to reinforce the lesson without really drawing attention to the fact that you're reminding them about following instructions until the lesson is complete. So it's kind of a fun way to get kids engaged. So everything we've talked about today is a small part of the preventive teaching component of the Boys Town Education Model. And our programs, for those of you who are familiar with it, like well-managed schools or specialized classroom management, go into a lot more depth and a lot more practice and strategies around how do you set expectations and how do you um, change behavior systemically. Just remember that behavior is predictable, and if you can predict it, then you can plan for it. So what we want you to do is think hard about the behaviors you're dealing with and work on setting your expectations to help ensure that you set yourself and your students up for success. It's time for us to hear from you again, so please go ahead and type in your chat box, remembering to go to all participants again, any questions you might have about rules, procedures, and skills, and we'll do our best to get them answered for you today in our time together. All right, I see a question here about how often would you recommend to review the rules for a first grade class? Well, really, as students who are just beginning to understand how school works, most first graders probably need lots of review and reminders. So how often you do that really depends on the difficulty that students are having with their rules and expectations and procedures. If you find that you need to review a rule more often than anticipated, students might need that rule simplified or they might be, need to be taught specifically what that means. Prompt students when they have the opportunity to follow that rule and make sure you're praising students when they're successful and reteach when they're not. Okay, here's another question. How can we handle tantrums or extreme emotional outbursts beyond cool down space or cool down time? That's a really great question. Many times students who exhibit emotional outbursts really benefit from being taught how to get themselves calm as part of your expectation. Remember the most beneficial time to teach a student how to calm down is during a neutral time and not in the heat of that tantrum at that time. So calm down strategies like deep breathing or squeezing a stress ball or listening to music could all really work for your student. And just make sure that after you're teaching them, Make sure you're prompting them when you want to see that, and, and hopefully you'll be able to predict that behavior by, what you're, by the triggers you're seeing from your student. And always remember that you're modeling, so make sure you're doing, using a soft voice when you're talking with them, using a slow rate of speech. That will help. Another question here, any suggestions on how to consistently monitor kindergartners while trying to multitask other classroom duties? That's a really tough one. So, Make sure you're teaching your kindergartners specific steps that you need them to follow during each center activity. That can be done as a whole group using that planned teaching format we talked about earlier, or it can be done during a neutral time and you can allow your students to practice the procedure under your guidance before allowing them to work on the centers. If they're having difficulty during center time, make sure you're reteaching and you're repracticing those expectations. And just double check that your procedures are making a lot of sense. Should they be more clear or simplified? If, if it becomes a regular problem, it probably needs to be simplified for those students. Great. Here's another question. How do you get students to understand what a conversational tone is? We've tried a numbering system. Many teachers find a numbered system for appropriate voice tone works really, really well for their students, and, and we've found a lot of success with that here. Just make sure that when you, if you want your students to fully understand what conversational tone sounds like, make sure you're specifically teaching what it is, when to use it, why it's used, and give them plenty of practice so you want to model that for them. At times when you expect your students to use a conversational tone, make sure you're, you're quickly prompting them or giving them additional practice prior to that. And always praise your students when you see them doing the right thing. That's about all the time we have for today. So what we wanna do is make sure you have an opportunity to ask us any questions that you may not have gotten answered during our time together. So if you'll do that, please email us at askthetrainer at boystown.org. Just a couple more reminders. Boys Town Press has a number of resources available for you. The activity guides we talked about today are available. And again, those outline terrific lessons to introduce social skills to your students. Also, that Teaching Social Skills to Youth book is available at boystownpress.org. In addition, we've got a number of low or no cost resources at boystowntraining.org. And I mentioned earlier that I was going to show you again how to get to that webinars page. 
So if you go to boystowntraining.org and access our resources tab, there you're going to find a lot of resources available to you. We have resources available such as Ask the Trainer videos, sample social skills videos, free lesson plans, and a list of our free or low-cost webinars. If you can see those boxes there on that page, just simply click on that page and you'll see what you're looking for. Also, you'll find the links for our social media. We're really active on social media on Pinterest, Facebook, and Twitter. So make sure that you're following us at BT underscore ed, and you'll see lots of discounts available and resources out there. Lastly, if you're interested in learning more about the training Boys Town offers that can be customized to meet the needs of your specific school, make sure you're reaching out to us. We've got that contact information for John McGuire here, and that's at 800-545-5771 or at training at boystown.org. Thanks again for being with us this afternoon. We wish you the best for you and your team for the rest of the school year.